This is March 19th, 2013, and I'm Dana Shadrick, the moderator of this casual discussion group. And these are longtime residents from the Barrington area, particularly in Barrington. And uh, they have lived here a very long time. Some of them were even born other than Good Shepherd Hospital because it's way before Good Shepherd Hospital. And I'd like to introduce them. The first gentleman on my right here is Michael Anthony Miller. The next gentleman is Ed Wickman. And the beautiful lady on the left is Sally Houlihan. And they're all long residents of Barrington. First thing I'd like to ask is, were you all born, you were all born in the Barrington area, I know, but where were you born? Were you born in the old hospital? Were you born, Ed, you were born in your home, weren't you? No, I was, I was born in Sherman Hospital. Oh, were you? Okay. And my, uh, <clears throat> my, my birthday is, is August 2nd, and it was 1945, and at that time, my mom was was in the hospital, I think, for 10 or 12 days, which was a regular yeah. kind of a thing. And I, she told me one time that, that the whole bill for me being born was like $75. But it was, uh, they dropped the atomic bomb on August 6th, and she, she told me later that every nurse in the, in the hospital came in because she had a radio in her room to, to, to hear about that. And, of course, she was in the hospital for a couple of more days, so it was the end of the war. Isn't that something? Yep. And other than that, I've been in Barrington. Okay. And Sally? I was born at home. At home? Yes. In your family house? And where my mother and father live, and it's where the community church is now. That used to be the old Baptist church. And the parsonage was next, and then there was a little bitty house, which has now been gone, and it has been, there's a big, big house there, a big two-story house. But that's the house that I was born in. I, uh, Dr. Graber was our doctor, and at that time, Sherman Hospital was not accredited. And so he would have, we would have had to go on into Chicago. And my mother didn't want to go to Chicago. And she was paralyzed. I was laying in the main nerve. So her mother, my grandmother, waited too long to call the doctor. And I was born at home. June 29th, 1935. That's fascinating. <laughs> That's fascinating. But that was even before Sherman Hospital was accredited. So. Now, what, what is your earliest memory? I, I, I get a kick out of asking this because I can't remember back before high school. <laughs> but maybe you can. Well, going back, I can remember going to Huff Street School and going to kindergarten there. And my teacher's name was Mrs. Wallace. Okay, now this was all grades, right? Yes, at that time. At that time. And my teacher's name was Mrs. Wallace. She was a very tall lady with brownish hair. And we had a sandbox, a big sandbox in the room that we could play in. And then when she would read to us, every once in a while somebody got to sit on her lap while she read to us. I thought that was wonderful. <laughs> I can remember back then, and then we used to have, in fact, I have pictures of uh, Halloween parties. Came all dressed up in costume and so forth, and Halloween parties. I can tell you the next one was Miss Bratzler, Miss Roller, Miss Miller. She was the third grade teacher. And I gave my third grade class the chicken pox. I went to school with chicken pox, never oh, realized geez. that I had it. I went to my grandmother's house for lunch, and my was itchy, itchy, itchy. She said, what is the matter with you? I said, I don't know, what like itchy. And she looked and she says, you got the chicken pox. So it wasn't too long. Most of the kids in the third, Mrs. Miller's third grade class had chicken pox. Wow. But I can go back that far. 
Ed, how about you? You know, I, I can remember kindergarten. Uh, the teacher's name escapes me at, at the moment, but for years I could name every teacher that I had, you know, I think through high school. Uh, I, I, I remember, you know, playing with blocks and with these big blocks that, that, that they had in the kindergarten. And I can remember they, they had some tools in there. And I can remember doing some sawing and some hammering with a nail, and they were they were real tools. Real tools. <laughs> and, and I was in kindergarten. After that, in first grade, I was with Marge Luther, and Marge Luther was was a teacher there for years and years and years. And she lived, and she she was a single later lady, but she lived with the Drovers. And the Drovers were on Cool Jam. She taught at Huff Street School. And the people that owned the house was, uh, was Percy Drover. And he owned uh, Drover Motors. When it was downtown, uh, it was the, uh, it was the, what, the, the, the LaSalle Bank. Before that, it was, it was Pankers. Uh, and Reavers. Yeah. Yeah. And that and that was a, a, a Plymouth dealership in there. But but Marge Luther was always one of one of my favorites. I want you to go on with other teachers. No, I tried Michael now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was actually uh, born uh, November seventeenth, nineteen forty three, at the Lying In Hospital in Chicago. Uh, I was delivered by a woman doctor. Uh, my first memory about coming to Barrington, I was eight years old. My sister Nina was uh, five, going on six, and my little brother was just around two. And uh, the uh, delivery truck with our furniture and goods started out at 6 a.m. and didn't get to our house until after midnight. There was a huge snowstorm. There was no heat in our house. Uh, slept on the floor in one room uh, after eating our first meal in Barrington in December 1951, which was uh, rabbit, which the caretaker into our property had shot that day. Uh, as far as teachers go, uh, my first teacher was my second grade teacher, Mrs. McCullough, and her husband, and she rented our coach house starting in 1951. Uh, they had a Model A Ford, not their main car, and we had uh, the uh, we we had uh, a 1949 Caddy Fleetwood that my pop bought, and a 1951 Cad Fleetwood. And the first get together in second grade was at the end of the year. They choose somebody's house to have a party, and they chose ours, 1952. I still remember that, and I have uh, photos of it. My second, my third grade teacher was Mrs. Richards. Her son was Richard Richards. Uh, my uh, fourth grade teacher was Mr. Sandman, who uh, told about uh, uh, Babyface Nelson being shot in Barrington around the Langendorf Park and how two G-men were, uh, were killed. And uh, he took on a bunch of uh, bullets himself. There's still bullets supposedly back then, when in 52, in the telephone poles from that shootout, and Nelson came out without any uh, protection and took something like 20 shots, and they dumped him out in some, near some cemetery in uh, Wisconsin. Uh, my fifth grade teacher was, uh, let's see, this is Miss Carlton, who never married. Sixth grade, Miss Fasick, who kept me out in the hall or in the principal's office a lot of the time. Seventh grade teacher was uh, Mr. Wingate, a scary soul. And uh, eighth grade teacher was uh, uh, Mr. Fry, whose uh, room you have dedicated there, the coffee room, there's a little plaque with him. And that's from grade school. The, uh, same, the teacher had the same man. Mr. Sandman, yeah. Was, did they live on North Avenue? I don't know where he lived. You know, I was only like, you know, nine, nine years old. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Sandman, uh, 
owned several houses in town, as think, but he'd left and went to northern Minnesota. And to my knowledge, he's still alive because he sold the house that's next door to mine uh, about a year ago. And uh, he, he just decided it was about time and he wasn't coming back to Barrington. And, uh, but he, he had a whole career teaching in, um, in Minnesota. So I'm, I'm pretty sure we're, we're the same, we're talking about the same yeah. family. I was, I was wondering whether it's the same Sandman that has a house on, it's the oldest house on North Avenue. And he owned a farm that went all the way up to North Barrington. And he sold that property off for the Biltmore Estates up there. Well, I, I would be a grandfather, I Probably his grandfather. He's probably not the teacher, definitely. But no. So. Well, yeah, because. Could be his son. You know. I can remember. I I think he lived on on the corner of Russell and Huff Street. He owned he owned that brick house. Okay. That that's there, and I know he owned the one on Grove and um, Lincoln. Okay, what about your best memory of uh, grade school? Anything stand out? You know, it was it was probably uh, I had uh, Bob Peterson. For, uh, for a teacher in fifth grade, and he's, he, he's a long time history teacher in Barrington, and he's, he's done a whole lot of things. But he, he probably influenced me the most. And, and, and there, there was two other guys that I really went. One was, uh, was Herbie Price, and Herb Price was, was a PE teacher, later the, the principal uh, before Don Thompson at uh, the station campus over here on, on, on the middle school mm -hmm. uh, and he, he handled boys and girls PE classes well, when I was there for 7th and 8th grade and he, he would go he would handle some of the grade school kids too because when I was there it was, it was K through 8 and right, right after that they built the, the station campus what about middle school? Any uh, recollections there? Uh, middle school, it was it was Walt Pagels, and he was he was later the principal of Huff Street School, and and he he passed away relatively young. He uh, he, he suffered from uh, from cancer, mm -hmm. but he was the industrial arts teacher, mm -hmm. and uh, with with my dad being. Uh, um, iron smith, a welder, ornamental iron guy, and I, I had a, an uncle that, that was a carpenter, and I had a, another uncle that died young, George, what was his name, at, uh, he died when he, he was 23, uh, but I've seen pictures where he put the boiler in the Catlow Theater. Okay. And he, well, he was, I guess, one heck of a plumber heating guy. So I, I just grew up liking, liking the trades. So, um, Huff Street School, of course, I went to Huff right. Street School, and we were in the south end. The north end was the high school. And the stairs on the north end were worn. They were like this yeah, from so many kids going up and down. And I was the patrol girl, there were many of us, to keep the high school nasties from running through to get to the other side. So at lunchtime, we, with our white oh, yeah. belts, stood at the door and said, you can't go through here. And I was probably in fifth grade. Not a good person to tell high schoolers that they can't do what they want to do. But there were many of us, boys and girls. That was one of my good memories. And also, um, Agnes Welch. She taught my brother, who was 10 years younger. She taught me. She taught my mother. 
my father, my aunt, and my cousin. She was a history teacher. And in the old school, fire escapes were these big, round, that tubes. went down to the yeah. ground, tubes that went down yeah. to the ground. And one day we had a fire alarm, and her room was on the west side, and it had one of those big round tubes. And of course we all had to leave. Well, we all went down, and Barry Berghorn and Stan Hartwig said, come on, Miss Welch, we'll get you down. She said, no, she says, the captain goes down with the ship. <laughs> but she wanted to make sure that we all got down. So of course, the, the two biggest boys in class, they went down first, and then they caught everybody else going down. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Had a great time that day. <laughs> Michael, how about you? Well, I would say my first memory um, was 1952, and I, unlike uh, Ed and Sally, went to Countryside School on West County Line Road. And I remember her, myself and my little sister was then six, I think, and I was eight. We were walking to school. It was only like maybe less than a quarter mile away from where we live. And uh, we noticed that the, the field just before getting to the school was sort of muddy. And I went in first, and I got stuck. I couldn't move. We had boots on, but I couldn't pick my feet out of the mud, and I couldn't get out of my, my boots. And my sister, either to rescue me or just to follow suit, came in, and she got stuck. And this is before school to start. We're sitting there, and seventh and eighth grade faced that part of uh, the premises there, and we saw the seventh and eighth grade looking out of the windows, pointing, and, and all of a sudden, two eighth graders, which were like super adults for us at the time. Nina was in uh, kindergarten, I think, and I was in second grade, and they came out and rescued us. I don't know if we came with our boots, if we died with our boots on or not, and we were taken into the school. Uh, outside of that, I'd say my next memory was in, that was particularly uh, um, stand stood out was uh, in sixth grade. Uh, we um, we had our uh, party at Wally Geeson's house, which was on Otis Road, and they had a beautiful little lake there. And Mike Highland who was one of the wild bunch. We were known as sort of a wild grade school class. Uh, all of a sudden, jumped in the lake. So, of course, I followed, uh, Marty Castle followed, I think Lowry White followed, and the uh, come up of so it was we were suspended for three days. So those are my outstanding <laughs> memories. <laughs> How about middle school? Well, I didn't, there wasn't any middle school. Uh, we we okay. went, you know, went up to eighth grade at Countryside School. Okay. Uh, I don't know what House Street was, so we went to look directly to high school. Yeah, let's move on to high school. Gee, what a Christmas! Like, I was pretty much uh, was, um, a forgotten soul, maybe for high school. I really didn't like school. Uh, I didn't. I thought homework shouldn't be a sign that that was my time off. Uh, I liked going hunting with my BB gun after school. That was in grade school. In high school, um, well, one of the my memories was that in. Uh, in gym class, and uh, we had Mr. Matty, and he was very authoritarian and would uh, uh, assign certain uh, punishments if you did wrong. Well, one of his punishments was uh, that uh, if you did something wrong, he would get, bring a certain commodity and you would have to polish and clean and oil them during the whole gym class. And I remember particularly two boys who did this. The commodity he brought was his hunting shotguns. So I don't think that that kind of a penalty would be assigned anymore. <laughs> not, in, uh, not at this day and age. <laughs> That's funny. Dad, how about high school? High school, probably the most fun I've had in my entire life. <laughs> I, I was, I, almost didn't get through my uh, my sophomore year and you know I was I was having way too much I played football and I was running around with a bunch of guys and didn't really care about anything and I think I ended up the year with, with four D's and two B's 
and, and the bees were in PE and drafting. <laughs> and I thought that was pretty good. Uh, I, I, I didn't get arrested. Uh, the, the teachers we had uh, were, you know, were, were, were coaches. And uh, let, me, let me think here a little bit. Uh, that was at the present high school. Yeah, it's, it's at, at the present high school. Uh, I started in 1959 and graduated in 63. Uh, I had a cousin, Jack Whitman, that was, the, I think, the first graduating year out of that school. And he graduated either in, I, I think it was 51, is, is when he graduated. And then, of course, I've had all kinds of cousins and my sister and everybody else, you know, that's, my kids graduated from, from Barrington High School. My dad graduated from Barrington High School. Of course, then it was at, uh, at Huff Street. Huff Street yeah. And uh, winning or, or doing as well, I, I think we're, we're still considered to be one of the better football teams around. At, uh, in, in the 62 season it would have been, but you know, then we graduated in June of 63. But, but we were 8-0, and, and the one thing I remember is we scored 300 offensive points and our opponents scored 50. Who was your coach? Bill Graham? Uh, Fredericks, Tom Fredericks. Oh, what, what and Bill Graham. Play? I played a bunch. I played, I, I played uh, center. I was a long snapper center, but I was second string to Gary Fink. And that, that's, that's another family that's been in town for a long, or was in town, town for a long time. And I, I played defensive tackle. Um, I, I, and, and on a couple of teams, I was the opposing team's best running back, you know, so they could because we, we would run plays against the other team. Right. And, of course, our, our best back was, was Kim Wood, and he was an All-Stater and went, went to Wisconsin. And the, the kid I remember was, was a kid by the name of Andy Marutka, and he went to Palatine, and, of course, that was still, you know, Palatine and Barrington is still a huge rivalry. Sally, how about your high school? My high school class was the first class out of the new high school, the present high school, four years. We went in as freshmen, we came out as seniors. There were three other classes ahead of us, but the class of 53 started as freshmen and went out as seniors. And our class was 108 at the time, and we were the biggest class. When my daughter graduated in 79, there were almost 3,000. And I always told her, I said, you know that girl that you were walking with, who was that girl? And she'd say, Mom, I don't know who that was. I know everybody in school. But there were only about 500 kids right, when I was right. there. So I always had to remember the numbers got very, very large by the time my kids went through high school out there. Is there anything, the Marston Three of you, is there anything that really stood out in high school, like a dance or parades or celebrations? I think one of the things, of course, we all, high school was the place to be. That was where everything, in the summertime, the pool was where you were and everybody gathered. If you went to the movie, you went to the Capitol Theater. There were not that many cars to go and do <laughs> but at my age, you, you didn't. And so those were the three areas that kids gathered. And then the canteen. That was also a place to gather. So many of my memories are Saturday afternoon games, football games, out of high school. Everybody went. You know, you, you just weren't anybody unless you went to the football game in the mm -hmm. afternoon. Where did, where did you go on dates? Most generally to dances, yeah. to events at the high school, so sporting you, events and so forth, movies, that type of thing. Yeah, did you? Yeah, you, we, you know, they, they were doing sock hops in and, you know, 
I was I, I liked the stuff that they had at school. You know, I went to the basketball games. I went to track meets. I went to baseball games. I, you know, we, we we went to all the dances, all the sock hops, all the plays. Did they have the revolving crystal ball on the ceiling that put lights all? Around? You know, they, they they had they had the prom in the high school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was always a, a big deal. And uh, Grace Wanke was, was in yes. charge of it. And she was a math teacher and uh, Miss Welch's roommate. Yes. You know, they owned a house on yeah, they, uh, on Russell Street. Yeah. But anyhow, they would decorate the whole the whole gym. You know, and they, they had the these walls. yeah these, these walls and they were they were covered with paper and they were painted with the with the theme and that was always a I never got to do it but there was. There, there, there was a committee of kids that got off a whole week of school before the prom to, to decorate the, 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 the gym. And if you didn't have a date to the prom, Miss Wonky knew. And if there was a young lady who did not have an escort, you better hide because if Miss Miss Wonky found you, she found a date for you. Is that right? Oh yes. And, and the other thing, the other thing they did was we had they they had I don't know it must have been the law of my junior or senior year because that's the only time you could go to prom you know but um, they they just finished the the addition with the with the theater and uh, I guess it was a, it was a mass science wing or you know that it, anyhow it, it was a huge addition. That, that they put on the school. And when they had the prom, we had to line up down that hallway with our date. And we had, I mean, until everybody was there. Well, it didn't have any air conditioning. It was about 105 degrees, I can't remember. All the poor girls are wilting. Flowers as well. Yeah. And, and we had to do a, a grand march, and we walked from one end of the school down to the gymnasium outside and into the prom. And most every one of the kids' parents were there to watch these kids march in to the, uh, to, to the prom. And, and you came in and you split out and ended up with this huge block of kids. All the parents All were up in the balcony. Up there. Yeah. yeah, but it was just it, it was the way things were. It, yeah. You know, you didn't think anything about it. Right. Well, that? I'd like to backtrack a little and tell a, an important story. I think about an experience I had in grade school when I was still in second or third grade, age uh, uh, nine or ten. Uh, my sister and I thought there was a haunted house. Uh, at, at uh, the end of Don Lea abutting uh, Bateman uh, uh, Road, and we got our mother to take us there. Um, we were looking through the house. Uh, it was like Civil War uh, blankets and coats, uh, magazines and newspapers inside piled to the ceiling, uh, calendars on the wall for going back to 1920, and we were looking around and looking around, thinking it was in, uninhabited, when all of a sudden I found a pocket watch laying on a bureau. I looked at it and it was ticking. So we got sort of scared about that, although we still went to the barn and noticed there was sheep in there and other animals and for some reason the occupants weren't there. Well, we found out later that that was uh, the uh, place of Old Man Jackson and his family who may have been the first uh, family to come to uh, Barrington in the 1830s. Uh, they are in those old calendars that they have, uh, that uh, Barrington has put out, and they all had long white beards, much longer than mine, and one of the, uh, of the children that was mentally challenged, and um, they were known as people who were uh, very um, conscious of their property and so-called uh, friends of mine, uh, such as John Renshaw, said that he'd gone on the property and been shot by one of the Jacksons with, by uh, rock salt. He wouldn't load the shotguns, of course, with real uh, uh, shot, but he'd be shot with rock salt. Whether that was true or not, I don't know. 
And there was another thing, they, they were not poor. They came from the East. They had, in the calendars, they have a beautiful big marmon or some kind of expensive car from 1909 or 1910. And the story about them was that during the Pre Depression in the early 30s, uh, they'd helped out the bank. Uh, uh, someone had come and given the bank deposited a bucket of gold coins. Well, I don't know if it was true or not, but 30 years later, in uh, the early 1980s, I think I was riding my bike, and I went to the old place there at uh, Don Leah and Bateman, and they were cleaning it out. Somebody was there cleaning it out because it was going to be turned over to the Forest Preserve. They were going to raise the building. There was old bottles in the windows I still saw. And so I told the gentleman there, who I hadn't seen before, you know, I, I remember that they used to say that the Jacksons helped out uh, the bank in the Depression, uh, that uh, they brought a, a bucket of coins, of gold coins. And he said, there were two buckets, and I carried them. Mm -hmm. So that keyed in over a 30-year period about the, the may have been the first family in Barrington, my experience with that. Was that, was that the... Uh the First National Bank they were dealing with? Yeah, it was, or, but, or you the know, the old bank. 1916 one, the one that McGonagall's is, is now. Oh, that was a state bank. You know, yeah. The state, it it the still state has bank. The, you know, and the thing written in stone about it. That was built in 1916. My grandfather, the, the blacksmith, was on the board of the state bank. And they always, and in, in the shop building, he ended up with the president's desk and chair and a filing cabinet from the president's office. But the, the bank had a run on it, and they managed to pay off everybody. And I'm not, sh you know, and, and if they carried it, and, and it's kind of interesting that, that, that the gold was carried in there, and I wonder if he got paid back. Yeah, that was, uh as I said, I only know what I know. <laughs> yeah, that. what? No, that, that, that's that, that's kind of cool. And uh, my well, my, my grandfather worked for that bank, you know, or was on the board of that bank, and very proud of the fact, you know, that they they had paid off the bank or my, paid off all all the depositors. My father didn't do that well. He, had, after working, he had his own company started at age 19 in Pittsfield, Illinois. And he took out his life savings. He worked for 13 years, 16 hours a day. He told me once at the Old Burt's restaurant for uh, seven days a week and had not turned a profit. And then in the early, like 1933, around there, he took out his life savings, $700. And then he decided for some reason to redeposit it, and he lost all his money. Seven hundred dollars. The the banks closed, and that was it. His life savings were gone. Wow. That's interesting. The the other thing I can add to that the the house I live in and the house my grandfather bought, I believe he bought it from the from the Jacksons, and the old Jackson moved into town because he, he wasn't able to, to do much farming anymore. He, he moved in, into town and in 1874 built this addition. That's, you know, I've got a historical plaque on the house. That was 1874 that he, he put this big addition on my house. And that I know of, you know, somebody may have owned it in, in between that, and I haven't gone back to research it. But uh, it, it very well could, could have been he bought the house from a Jackson Sr. Yeah. You know, uh, <clears throat> when, you were, when you were younger, you remember Barrington being one way, and over the years it's really changed. What, what do you think about the changes in Barrington since you were younger? Bar Barrington was... was a, a typical, well, I can't say typical small town. It was it, it was a very close knit town, and as even as as a kid, there were the kids that lived outside of town, or the people that lived outside of town, and the people that lived in town. 
And for the most part, everybody knew everybody. And then with my dad with a business in town, and our, our house was like three blocks from the, uh, from the blacksmith shop. And of course the blacksmith shop has been moved over to the Barrington Historical Society site. Um, and they, uh, you know, re redone it, and that's the, the main part of the, of the museum over there was the shop my grandfather built in 1929 and was able to keep it, <laughs> you know, with, when, when the Depression hit. But was at one time, weren't there like three blacksmith shops in, in Barrington? Yeah, in, in the early, in the early days, days, there was there was three or four, well, there the there, there was the Creek blacksmith shop, there was the, the Wickman blacksmith shop, there was the um, the one right, well, it's kind of where Catchpenny is now, was, uh, I can't remember the name of it. But anyhow, there, there, there were three or four blacksmith shops in town. There were five hotels in town. Do you know, do you, wow. wow. And that was, and that was early, you know, late 1800s. And, and they, they were all on uh, Lake Cook Road, and, you know, which was right across the street from, from the train station. And the, all the salesmen that, that would come to town, you know, would, would stay overnight. And, would, and of course, would, would generally do, go all the way up the line on, on the Northwestern, you know, to sell their wares. And we had what? We had three major grocery stores in town. Right. We had National Tea, we had A and P, we had Jewel, plus all of the mom and pop stores. Yeah, we had the Centrala with uh, with the Cleppers and, and the Wendy's. Huh? And we had Landwurst. Landwurst. And then um, later on, we had Tinkerman's that ran and Brockways that ran those little, you know, where you could run in on a Sunday night and pick up lunch meat and so forth. And then Orville Weddy started his up right next to, well, it's Einstein's. It's now. Einstein's. Yeah, now. it's Einstein's now. Mm -hmm. So we had all of those. We had restaurants in town. Didn't, didn't your mother uh, have a restaurant? My mother had eight restaurants. She yeah. had two of them, three of them in town, two in Fox River Grove. These are all at different times. Different times, yeah. And two in Alabama. Where, where were the ones in Barrington? She started out near where Harry Oates had his place on 14, and it was an eight-stool little place, and that was the first one. And then Anderson's Flower Shop, which was across the road, when they gave up, then she opened that up as a bigger restaurant, and that was a regular restaurant. You had booths and, and counters and so forth. And then from there, she went out to where the Pontiac Garage is. There was a little building out there. And her being, well, the Anderson place, she did have dinners, but usually it was breakfast and lunch was her strong, strong suit. And then she went to Fox River Grove. I'm trying to think where that one was. Um, next to ja uh, Philip Lou in that area. And then she had a hot dog stand down by the river one summer where the boaters would come in and she had hot dogs and oh, something else. I can't think what they are now, what they're called. But they would buy them by the bushel basket full, take them on the river and go up the river for an afternoon. Mm -hmm. And then she went to Algonquin and she had one over there. Now, what, what time period was this? Oh, let's see. I was 20. And I'm 77 now, so you know how long ago it was. That's when she started. Because I was just about to be married when she opened up the first one. Well, what about the bikes at this shop? When did the last, what, your, your, was it your father, grandfather? Did your father, well, my, my did, dad. your dad get into it too? Uh, yeah, but, but my dad bought the business from my grandfather okay. in uh, 1937, I think. Uh, and 
my dad wanted to buy the building too, but my grandfather wouldn't sell it to him, saying, "Hey, that's that's my retirement. You know, if if, if I sell the building, you know, I haven't got a whole lot of income." Even even though we we were getting into the era of, of uh, social security, but it wasn't it, it wasn't all that much. Anyhow, my dad built a building out on Northwest Highway, which is now uh, Enterprise Cars, mm -hmm. and that was the first building that, that he put up, and that was 1957. And they built the building, he, he moved in, and he, he only stayed open in that building until about 1964. And he decided, and by that time, he'd added uh, the two other stores on the side of it, which is now La Mesa and the restaurant La Mesa out there, and there's one other store in there now. Uh, he could he was he was making more money renting the uh, renting the uh, the building than he was working, mm -hmm. and so so that's what he did. Uh, we sold the building in, my dad passed away in 84, and we s sold the building, I think, in 93 or 94, 93, I believe. And that's just sitting vacant for now. Yeah. But there, there were three Wickman shops. One, you know, the, the first one was over on Railroad Street, right on just off of Lake Cook Road, where the, I believe it was right next door to the building, the village is just taken down, and that, that originally was one of the old hotels. Is there any? Do you remember the names of any of those old hotels? No. Are any of those still standing? You said they were on, on County Line Road, do you think? Yeah, like Lake Cook Road. Right. Or the, the, the where the, Chow Baby restaurant is that group of stores. In that, in that area? I don't know. There was, you know, there was the dress factory in town that everybody talked about, and originally I know that was that was a, a hotel. And I think where Chow Baby is, I think that may have been a store downstairs and. Strange dress was upstairs. Uh, yeah. Other than that, I, I think where the where the uh, car the car repair store is, right in in that same group. Hollis Brothers. Yeah, Hollis yeah. Brothers. I think that was a hotel at one point. Because we can, I don't know. I if if we went back and looked at some of the old pictures, you can kind of tell, you know, when they had all the windows lined up, you know. And then the castle, the little castle place, you know, on the corner. The White Castle. I call that the castle. White Castle. Yeah. That was the old telephone company. Yeah. My mother worked there as yeah. a night operator. And um, I'm trying to think, then where Jewel was, the house at the corner where we live, that was moved in from that area when Jewel started. It, it amazes me how often they moved houses in Barrington. Back well, and they, Foxy they Shop was a good, he was a good you know, they put them on the wagons and horse mm -hmm. and drew them to a different area. And they were big houses. Yeah. yeah. They, were, they were big houses. Yeah. Are, we, are you talking about the jewel that's no. right? Yeah, don't you remember? That's now the empty lot where, where the, it, it was the first federal bank and then it was... No, 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 where the jewel is now. Or the there was a now. whole bunch of houses in there. Yeah. Um, and then when Jewel started, with, you know, the post office was up in the front. Right. And then Archer's Shoes was down the bottom side. That's all gone. And that's all parking lot now for the Jewel, the present Jewel. And mm -hmm. there were uh, there was um, a bookstore in there. Uh, I think no, no bookstore in there. I'm trying to think what else was in there. You know, that, that very question is what prompted me to take those photographs and build a photo display that's in the village hall. Because people couldn't answer the question of what was in front of the present jewel store. And I knew the Eisenhower Post Office was there, yeah. but I didn't know what other houses were there initially. Well, here, when I was a child, 
there that was there were houses along there. Oh, yeah. And then the one that's on the corner where I live, that was moved up there. Right. Now they have since added to it. It's huge now, but at that time and in fact when my husband and I started looking for homes, we looked at that house. And it was eighteen five, same price as our home. And my dad looked at it and he said, It needs a lot of work, even though it had been moved in, but it needed a lot of work. So he said, Look at the newer houses and see what you think of those. And so we ended up buying one of the newer homes. But um, there must have been at least four of them that we moved out of there. There was one two story, I think that was like a duplex at that time, that was near the Capitol Theater. And my cousin and his family lived there for a short time. Hmm. And then there was another couple of smaller homes, um, not well cared for. And I think that's the reason why they got rid of those, and that's when they started developing that area. That was, that was before 1927, right? Because the Capitol was built in 1927. Well, yeah, that would, yeah. That would be in that area. Yeah. You have to remember how old I am. Yeah. <laughs> Fascinating. My dad was a uh, was an usher at the Capitol Theater, and one of the things that happened when when they opened the new theater, they invited the the cast of Our Gang Comedy, and the Our Gang guys, you know, was Alfalfa and right. what were some of the other characters oh, in that. Anyhow, my, my dad drove these guys around with a sign in the back of his Model T Ford that said it was our gang comedy, and come and see him at the, at the Cat Catlow Theater, yeah. And I always, I always thought that was kind of cool. And I do have a picture of that somewhere, of him driving that car around. Now, I heard that, like, Eddie Cantor and Judy Garland Played there. I mean, in the old Waterville days, they, they had live theater there. And of course, Mr. Yankee, the projectionist, uh, he actually, they had a little theater where the town shop used to be, you know, on uh, Cook Street there, on the corner for so long. They had a little theater there, and when he was in high school, 15, 16 years old, he ran the projector there. And that guy was the first projectionist at the Catlow from 1927 until the early 90s. Oh, that was him. And they had another projectionist that's, that uh, was Jim there Hulse from there. 1940 on. Those Jim were the Hulse. only Jim two. Hulse. They, yeah, they, the they only know two. him. And I went to a party in the early 90s with Mr. Yankee, who was still hale and hearty, had a full head of hair, and <clears> celebrating all those years where he was projectionist. And Tim and, and Roberto run it now. They were so afraid that Mr. Yankee had called down to us. We went up to the projection booth. Tim gave us a, 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 a tour of the, of the Catlow, and uh, we went up there in those little bitty stairs. They just had the new projector, not the digital one now, but they'd had the same project from 1927 into the, the 90s. And uh, so that's my memory of it. And that, that uh, statue at the end of the hall, I don't know what artist it is there when you go. That's a very it's famous. Very, very famous. Uh, who is it? It's very nice. I yeah, it's a famous uh, um, sculptor, who, and I think that's worth quite a bit of money now. Now, another thing I'd like to say that I remember, a couple things, is if you remember the sign that was all, uh, across from the high school coming, going east into town, there was an old rusty sign, if you remember it. Does anybody remember it? It was a skull and crossbones, and it must have been from the 20s, and it said, Drink, drive, die. And that thing was there from when we moved here in 51, I think, till at least the, the, in, you know, the later 50s. And also that plot where the PepsiCo is now that used to be Quaker Oats, they used to, when we came in the early 50s, it was a helicopter depot, and they had that, we would come to town just to see the helicopter land there, and I think it was bringing mail or something like that. Could very well be. Do you remember Kenny Brown used to play the organ? He had that big, beautiful organ down in front. And before the movie would start, why, you could come in and sit and play I don't, the I think up. that you predate me, and I don't think they had a live That may, Maybe not, as I say. Just a little bit. You have to remember how old I am. 
And they used to have dish night and 15 cent night during the Depression when, you know, it was hard to get people to come to the theater. They didn't have any money. Right. Well, you, had, you asked before about first dates. That's where I had my first date with Nancy Potter when I was in seventh or eighth grade, and everyone was checking to see if I leaned close with my arm around her. I, I had my first kiss with Nancy Potter, and uh, old Mr. Catlow, we used to do st crazy stuff in grade school. We used to bring our pea and bean shooters, and I had a little cannon that I'd shoot shotgun uh, pellets out at people, and they grab the back of their head, and Mr. Cantley used to be scream all of a sudden in a special part of the movie, and uh, Mr. Cantley uh, would kick us out, but I was so little, like when I was a freshman in high school, 15, weighing in for wrestling, I weighed uh, 81 pounds and was four, four foot eight and a half, and I would just hook around when he was leading us out and go back into the theater. That was another thing. And uh, Mr. Cantley, he used to have one day for little for kids where he would show cartoons and that would be a free freebie. Everybody would come and they used to have the those old time, the old -time uh, movies? movies where they would have a weekly, yeah, you know, the where cereals. The, the, the cereals, the cliffhangers where somebody would be out on the rail, a woman and screaming and the train was coming and there was no way that she was going to get away. Well, when they showed it next week, it was changed up. It wasn't quite as close that they showed it before, and she got off way before what you'd seen before. So it was sort of hooked up, but that was another thing they did. Uh, didn't they have a, an organ or a piano in the front of the catalog? That was, that was, like? that was Kenny Groom. It was beautiful. It was a big, uh, almost like a woman's, I think, uh, organ. And it was gorgeous. They had a bunch of keyboards, if I remember. Yeah, and yeah. he would come in probably Maybe 20 minutes before. The pipes were probably up in those enclosures mm -hmm. on, on either side of the screen. I, I can remember what you were saying. Oh, right, Catlow, you know, because it was Friday nights, so all the kids would go to the movies. Yeah. You know, and, and they'd go to the movies, and, and he'd be walking up and down the aisle to see who had their arm where, you know. On, on, <laughs> on one. Well, that was his dream, <laughs> to have a big theater, and he went through with it. That place cost. One hundred and twenty thousand dollars or more oh, in, yeah. in the nineteen twenty-seven. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And didn't he have Italian workers come over and do those interior walls? Whatever he had, you know, our house was built the same, uh, the same year, nineteen twenty-seven. We're two miles west on County Line Road, and our uh, fixtures. Uh, Light fixtures are still original in our house, and they're very similar to, to the ones that the Catlow has. What, uh, what other big occasion, big events impress you in Barrington? I know the Fourth of July parade and so forth are a big deal, but uh, what other occasion, big snowstorms? When, when John F. Kennedy spoke on the high school steps, yeah. In 19, 1962, and one of the guys lived in Barrington that, that was with John Kennedy on the PT-109, and his name was Barney something. Barney Ross. Ross. Barney Ross. Right, right, right. I remember. Yeah. And, and I, I particularly right remember that because I, I thought that was really cool that we had a presidential candidate coming there and I was like about a, a junior in high school and I, I, I wanted to go up and shake his hand. You but know? my sister shook his hand, my sister you know? Nina. That was 1960. He was campaigning right on the front oh, of the Oh, is that right? Well, yeah. Then I was young. I, yeah. I, 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 wanted, I wanted to shake his hand and a Secret Service guy gave me a forearm shiver. <laughs> I landed yeah. on my yeah, bottom. I, saw him. I remember seeing him. <laughs> yeah, but but that you know I, I I thought that was a huge deal. Um, as 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 a kid, I, I should bring this up and mention one of the things that I thought was one of the neatest things was the jewel tea picnic. Now you had to be you had to work for the jewel tea plant, but every summer. They treated everybody to a, a, a day and a carnival, and they had
pony rides and Ferris wheels and merry-go-rounds and free beer, free ice cream, free everything out there. Was that uh, what is now Citizens Park? Mm -hmm. Correct. The, the, yeah. The Gold Grey Lady. And I got to go to it because I had two uncles and and two aunts that worked out there and then a bunch of other shirt tail relatives that, that were working out there and we, we'd always end up with with four tickets for our family to go out to that so I over the years I probably went to two or three of them anyhow but I thought that was a that just was, a, that really, was a, big event. a really a really big deal. And right. it was almost the whole tunnel practically went. Yeah, because good. everybody was employed. Either had a mother, father, aunt, uncle, somebody was employed out there. I liked the carnivals out at North Park too. <clears throat> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Well Bob Asher, the, the Western singer, used to from Barrington, you remember him? Yeah. Used to play his guitar with fancy shirts and, and big cowboy hat. That was like he was Famous, like in the late 40s and early 50s. Yeah, well, he had his own serial TVs. Right, right. Uh, serial movies. At that, at that point. And going back a little bit further, my father was on the fire department. So my memories of special things, quote unquote, were fires. When Plaggy's fire, uh, Florence burned down. And it was wintertime. My dad got sprayed with water. He came, they had to bend him over to get in the car. It froze. And he came home and got in the bathtub right away, and so he never even got cold out of it. But we thought, oh my gosh, he's going to be sicker than a dog. Never even got a cold out of it. <coughs> and uh, we had a fire buck here years ago that was setting barn fires. And at that time, uh, my mother was friends with uh, Kenny Reapy's wife and the three of us. We chased the fire trucks. Can't do that anymore. But, um, and then when my mother was night operator, um, she ran the whistle. So many turns this way, so many turns this way. When the whistle would go up and down at night, and then she'd give my dad a call. It's fire. Yeah, ready remember, to go. Remember the old steam engines? You know, we were talking about the depot. Most, you could hardly talk. They were so, just like breathing monsters. Now, I drove cab in Barrington on and off from 1973 to 1990, and I used to get an old uh, driver that uh, used to drive limo and cab back in 1937. And he said Barrington at that time had 17 cabs, that they had cabs going all over to different places, and he said that the Northwestern uh, train used to be able to go uh, from downtown Chicago to Waukegan in 45 minutes. Now, I don't know if it's true or not, but in those days they didn't have the rules like they do now that you have to slow down between towns. This one, it was, it was, that was an express, it didn't stop anywhere, and you could go, those trains back then could do over 100 miles an hour. They made maybe 90. Uh, they weren't slow, and they would go 90 the whole way. Do you, uh do you remember in 1976, the celebration? I think it was at the Joel property, and they had a hot air balloon. People would go up in the balloon, they'd pull them back down again. That was a big celebration in 76. That was a particular That's a 200th anniversary. Yeah, I was going to say it was a particular anniversary yeah. of, uh, of that. But uh, a lot of people in town worked at Jewel, you know, oh, yeah. in the packaging during World War II. Two when they made the food packages, you know, that they <coughs> made food packages out there. And, they uh, made all the sea rations. Yeah, sea there. rations, that's what I'm looking for. And um, I'm trying to, my mother and my grandmother and her cousin all worked in the kitchen out there. Mm -hmm. And I have pictures, old pictures of, of those. That's the reason why my mother's family came to Barrington. It was, I think, during the Depression, and my grandfather, great, yeah, grandfather, he was a mechanic, and the Pattons had come, and they lived in town. Myrtle had gone to work at Jewel, 
And she said, well, if you come up, we can hire you at a jewel. So then my grandmother got a job at Jewel, and my father, my grandfather, was an automobile mechanic for the Buick company. Hmm. The Buick that was in town. At the Chapel. Time. Chapel Brothers, yeah. And so that's why they came up, because there was work. They could, and they lived out on what was called the Berry Farm, which is on Cuba Road, which I, I don't know who lives there now, but I think it was one of the first um, farms out on Cuba Road. And they lived there when we first came to town. So, and my father's side of the family, his father was a conductor on the Chicago Northwestern Railroad. And that's how they got out to Barrington. Hmm. He found property out here, and they built a house on 214 West Russell Street. It was a single family though to start with, and then when he passed away early, because of tuberculosis, my grandmother put an apartment on upstairs, and that's how she sustained herself through through uh, her lifetime, mm -hmm. and with various people as being. And had any of you heard that there was a roundhouse, a railroad roundhouse in Barrington at one time? Oh, absolutely. Where was I, it? I used to go play on. Where was <laughs> it? Well, it, it wasn't a roundhouse; it was a turntable. Yeah. Okay. You know, but but the steam engines would would, would come in, uh -huh. and they they put them on the on the turntable, turn them around, they they go back, they hook it back up. Where, where was it? Right, essentially, right where the depot is now. Really? Yeah, Be, because the the depot each each time you, right. the last depot which is now right. Chessie's, yeah. you know, was about halfway between where it is now and the, and the right. crossing on Cook Street. So it was, it, it, it was closer to the, to the city, and it was kind of in, in the parking lot down there now. You know, I, I guess it would be, be the... You know, you're a year younger than I am, and I don't remember that. You know, I, I spent thousands and thousands of hours Parked with my cab outside what is now Chessie's, the old depot. Well, so so you, I know you, all about it. You, you knew Helen Hummel or, or all about the Hummel cabs? <laughs> um, I don't remember that. When we came to Barrington, there was a Mr. Toynton that was sort of a heavy drinker, and uh, he was the only one around town. In those days, there wasn't any meters even. There was just certain, you could go anywhere in town, I think, for 50 cents. And we had a friend who... Uh, I talked to Ed a little bit about Milda Savage that he didn't remember that lived there on, uh, on South Grove. And one day he cleaned himself up, put on a suit, and went to Milda Savage's house. And he'd seen her get off the train hundreds of times probably, and he asked to marry her. <laughs> and uh, she said, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Toynton, I'm married. But she wasn't. She was a spinster her whole life. And that's the one story that I remember especially about Mr. Twink, the only uh, cab driver in town back then. Now you see pictures of the original train station it was on the other side of the track. Yeah, and yeah. then there was a little spur that the, the, the uh, boxcars would come up and they'd unload them on the other side of the, the train station. Yeah, where, where the parking lot yeah. is, is now, you know, by um, right. Park yeah. Avenue. That was, there, there, there were buildings there, you know, and, and I can remember like where, where the Harris Bank is, there was, that was a, a dairy, that was a Peterson dairy, I think. Okay. Dorley. Uh, huh? Dorley dairy. Uh, it could, well, yeah. Dorley dairy. And could my grandfather give me a nickel and I could go down and buy an ice cream bar down there. But, but they, they did milk every day and there was, there was a, it was a big barn down there that was kind of a warehouse. I'm not sure what it was. But I was pretty young. I was probably seven, something like that, and I can remember. When, when did the ice house close down, you know? Oh, gosh, it must have been. It, it was in the 60s, I think. They still had ice there, too. As well, I remember. You remember that when they used to play that game out in that plot? It's yeah. like croquet, but it's not croquet. 
And the, at night, on, like on Sunday nights, they'd have these big wickets. They were about a foot and a half high, yeah. and it's some kind of a, do you know what it is? German game or something. It's not yeah, short, game, but it's short. short yeah, short, short hand. Right, but they were big iron things. So they used things. to have little, little uh, hammer, you know, mallets that would just fit and, you know, be short, and they hit it, and we used to go and watch those. I you know, it was on crushed, crushed stone. Yes, that's right. Crushed, yeah. That's right. It wasn't in front of an old village hall. They had one of those at one time. I can remember the ice house. My my dad had a had a locker in there. You know, before we had a freezer in the house. Remember when the upstairs at the village hall was the only library in town? They had right. like about seventy five books or something like that. And uh, oh, we that was more than seventy. Well, whatever. I heard, I read something about the Palatine Library when they had started. They had something like thirty books or something, and there weren't very many in that village hall library. That's for sure. I worked in that I, library did for you? many years. Yes, oh. I did. So, I was born in the house that was right on that corner of Huff Street and Station Street. Right. Well, I did. That's where I was ten days old when I moved in. I guess, but. That was kind of, that. That was really kind of a, a neat building because it was the fire department, it was the village hall, it was streets and sand. Library. It was the library. It was the police department. All in that same little building, and every day they blew the fire whistle at noon. You know, to let everybody know that it was noon and time to go to lunch. Right. And it went, it went all over town. Now me, living in that house right next door to it, <laughs> I do have a recollection of that, but that's about all I have of living in that house because we moved out when I was three. But my aunt and uncle lived there until, until they tore it down. <laughs> yeah, I think I, they gave you pictures of it being yes. torn down. Yeah. Right. Well, the, I wanted them to keep it, but I talked to a lot of people. They said it was just so leaky and falling apart, and the rafters were wrecked in the attic and whatever. It was they couldn't fix it. It would cost more to fix it than to put in that new one that they did. I was in the Cub Scouts when when they built the the new library. Right. Up on uh, up on Huff Street, and I was in some Cub Scout group. And we had to carry all the books in boxes down and put them in a truck. Right. I, I didn't think there was that many books in the world. <laughs> who was here? We had a den ma uh, master, Mr. Crumrine, who ran it, who right. ran the Cub Scouts down at like at the VFW place out there near Russell or something. It was. They yeah. used to meet there in like 1952 and stuff like that. Roy Crumrine. Yeah, Roy Crumrine. I he his son was in my. High school class. I just sure. saw him at the at our 50-year reunion, and of course I visited before you know the uh, the big um, uh, parade on homecoming there this last uh, September. There were people from the class of 1937, 75th anniversary when you were two years old. So I waited to see and talk to some of these people. There was an old white-haired lady. I don't know her last name. Her name was Ruth, and I told her how beautiful she was. And just an aside. Uh, I think I was the only long-haired person in the class of uh, 1962 at the reunion. But out of the three uh, people that I talked to from the class of 1937, one guy had a long white ponytail. I don't know if it doesn't mean anything. It may not, but it's something. <laughs> Are there any other things you'd like to bring up? Anything from memories of Barrington? Any type of I would love to tell you the story of my of my and I think I've told it to you before of my my dad going to school. Now we, we live on, on Grove Avenue and it was about two two blocks from the Huff Street School and at that time it was uh, at, at at that time it was the high school and everything else. My dad, at age 11 and 12, started putting together a Model T Ford from parts. And he would go to the junkyard, which was down by where the, the village garage is now, or down off of Hager, I think. Yeah, and they, he'd go through piles of junk down there to see what he could find to put this car together. Well, within, within a year, 
he had, and he'd also befriended the guys at the um, at the Ford garage, which is right next door. Well, it's it's where that the the notice uh, dress shop is in town on uh, uh, Cook Street. That was, and it was inside the uh, the Schroeder building. Was the Ford garage, and my dad at eleven or twelve would go down and and talk to these guys in the Ford garage, and they helped him. His brother gave him a motor. The guys at the Ford garage helped him rebuild it. Okay, put this car together. Is that the one you still have? No. Okay. But you know the Model Ts were pretty much all the same. <laughs> My dad, at 12, would get into his car and drive it to school, two blocks. And the, the principal of the school was a guy by the name of Prof. Smith. And Prof. Smith knew everybody in the school, and he'd been there for a long time, and he lived fairly close to school, and he would ride his bike. Well. One day, my, my dad is driving to school at 12, smoking a cigarette, and he waves at Prof. Smith, who's riding his bike. <laughs> Prof. Smith goes in, and he calls up my grandfather. Well, my, you know, the shop, the, the, the shop at that time was at... Uh, Huff Street and, and Station Street, and Huff Street School was a block away. And he called him up, and he says, um, Mr. Wickman, he says, did you know that your son is driving to school? And my grandfather said, yeah. He said, you know, he was smoking? And he says, I'll tell you what, Prof. <laughs> You take care of him while he's at school, and I'll take care of him when it's at home. When he's at home, and that was the last that, that was, was ever that. said about it. Did he continue to drive to school? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. He kept he kept that car until after he graduated from high school, and in fact, he he was a five year high school guy, and he, he took this trip to Yellowstone National Park in that Model T in 1929, and 1929-30. And he was gone for uh, a month, month and a half, and you know, there was, I, he, he, he kept a log of that, and, and I do have that log of all the letters he wrote home and what everything mm -hmm. costs and things that happened, but you know, the first day, he got seven miles outside of Barrington and any kind of paved road end, ended. And the only way he knew what route he was on was every third telephone pole had a red, white, and blue stripe on it. And that was like the Route 66 going west. And he went all the way to Yellowstone National Park. He took the Model T up Pikes Peak. In fact, it was the first Model T to make it up Pikes Peak in that year. I haven't gone back there to check those books either, but I have a tendency to believe it. Well, well, I think I mentioned that 1925 Chrysler that I drove in the very centennial 1963. Well, I bought that car from the Coonses, from Bob Coons, who uh, lived out on Healy Road, and uh, that car uh, had been bought uh, by uh, uh, Bob Coons's father. It had been a doctor's car, and when I bought it, it had been stored in Wisconsin since 1946. Now, that car I just recently sold. I had it from 1963 to 2007. I had it 44 years. It was a two-door Brougham. Uh, that was actually the first model Chrysler ever built. It was started in 1924 by Walter P. Chrysler buying out Chalmers and Maxwell. They had that the original model, which I had, was the Model B, which became the, the uh, Chrysler 70 because it would do 70 miles an hour. It had a 68 horsepower 6, which was, you know, two cylinders more than, than the Model T and the Model A. And 
back still in the 50s, you could go to the Sears catalog, have not one part, not a bulb for the headlight, and you could build a Model A. They have everything you need, every part, engine, frame, lights, doors, everything. So that was sort of a neat thing. And, and uh, we used to know uh, uh, old Walter Topple, who lived, I think, out on uh, Route 62. He's gone now, but he worked for our family. He had been driving by our place in, like, 1952 or 53, and he owned two cars. He had a 1940 Pontiac and a 1929 Model A. And uh, my father hired him to work. He worked hard, 75 cents an hour. He was, we still have the blue paint that he painted our, our uh, place with. And he lived there. He was born, I don't know exactly when, but the only time he left that place out on, on uh, 62 was when he was in the Army. He, he lived there and, and died at uh, Sherman Hospital, and he drove that Model A into the 90s. Not like an old, a car that was stored. It was just like, had all the wear and tear. He put four engines in, in it. In the <laughs> he showed me some kind of oil. He said, this is good oil. And he had like one of these five-gallon cans of the worst kind of oil. That's why he had to put four engines in the car. And <laughs> he had like, I visited him. He was in a band that they had out here, in, I think in the 40s, it was called the Old Timers from the West. And he played accordion. He had he played for me in his house a couple times. He had two or three different accordions, but only one of them would play because the mice had gotten in, and eaten the bellows out of the other two. And he had calendars on the wall from 1940. At least I, I visited him, and once I had my girlfriend come up here when we visited him, I think the last time I saw him was 1983, uh, 82, uh, and uh, we went to visit him there, and that was another, there's not too many old coots that are interested in Barrington, I don't know, maybe I'm getting to be one. <laughs> <laughs> Sally, any, uh, any thoughts, any big events that you can think of? No, not really. You caught me short yeah. with the day's, uh, with the day's notice. I'll have to, I'll have to get back to you. Uh, I started to say before that when you grew up, grew up in Barrington, you remember what it was like then. You know what it's like now. What do you think of the changes in Barrington? Do you think there's been good changes? Do you think things are overdone? What, some what good, think? some bad. But you know, that's like any place. That's everybody has a different idea of what they want from a village. People come in and say, we came here because we liked what we saw. But then they proceed to change it. So uh, some changes have been good. What, you, what, what would you think if someone said to you, I want to come here and I want to build a six-story building? No. Down in Palatine, you know, no. eight-story building at any time there? That, that's the whole thing. And I think Barrington still has a problem with deciding whether they want to be a long grove or whether they want to be a Palatine. Mm -hmm. um, many people still like the old stuff that we have here yeah. and are delighted to not change it. Other people coming through who perhaps are not going to stay here forever, but they do start ideas that then we have to put up with. What do you think? Well, I'd say, you know, Ed was talking about how everybody knew everyone back in the old days. Uh, I don't think I'm that far old, but, you know, and I remember that too. And even when I drove cab in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, I knew lots of people in town. I go to, you know, like the big 4th of July parade, don't know but three people that walk by and go all along on my bicycle, don't know anybody. Went to the, the party there at McGonagall's this last St. Patrick's Day weekend. Didn't know anybody hardly. So that's a big change, I think. And uh, uh, I think that the preservation of the Bering Hills with the five acres is a good thing. Uh, and that makes us uh, a little bit different. And uh, um, that's the main thing I'd say to me is that I just don't know the people I used to know. Yeah, for the newcomers. Well, change change is inevitable. Sure. And you know, we we've, we've got we've got problems with traffic. We've got problems with too many trains and how they're 
you know, cutting things off. We're, we're, I, I, I think we, we made a huge mistake get, getting rid of, you know, the, uh, the, the jewel building. I think it was a much bigger asset. And it, for, for the amount of property that it took up, you know, they still could have had the, the same fields and park as, as they do now. Um, I think that uh, if, if we try to keep the village exactly the same way as it is and with, with low-rise stuff and the kind of roads that are going through here, eventually I think we're going to get bypassed. Uh, the train is, is still a huge asset. Man, the, the traffic problems we've got. Got to, but on, and on, the school system is is out of this world. I you know and I I, I think we're doing, as, to make a long story short, I think we're doing as good as we can. And we've got a lot of very capable people, you know, that are that are working to to try to keep up with with the traffic and keep up with businesses and keep up with jobs and all the stuff that, that, that we have, but nobody has come up with a great answer yet. One thing I'd like to question you on, you said that trains are a big asset. You're talking well, about, you about, about the Union Pacific, the Chicago Northwestern? Particularly the, the the Northwestern, yeah. you know, because of because of, of the ability to go to Chicago and all right. of, all of the other right. suburbs and but Canadian National, Canadian National, you know, it what happen. when it was the EJ and E and they were running two to or three trains a day and most of them were at night, yeah. you know, you know, I didn't, I didn't notice it at all. That. I lived near the train, didn't didn't even notice it, but now there are trains running through there constantly. And they're not really benefiting Barrington at all, except tying up traffic. How long have you lived? Uh, Forty-five years. Huh? Forty-five, 45. years. That's right up there. How about you? What are your? What was a big remembrance for you? Or? Um. One was that park that I mentioned, the uh, 1976. That's uh, Jewel Park. Citizens Park, Fourth of July parades. I just love them. We go every year. We really uh, just to see the families out. Uh, memories of Lepaskis. <laughs> um, kids growing up in a town like Barrington. Harold is still around. I think he's in Florida. You know, I remember going into Lepofsky's and I'd get a new pair of jeans. That was a big thing. Cause, uh, and Harold, would always, if you got Harold, he'd always say, well, why don't you buy two? Well, buy three. Why don't, why don't you buy uh, <laughs> six? You know? yeah. And I visited him not so long ago when my mother was alive and my brother Harlan, we saw him out in one of these nursing homes near the Fox River Grove, I forget the name of it there. And he, I think, was out. We saw him sitting out uh, at that Fourth of July parade uh, this last year, 2012. Yeah, he was. He was uh, in the car at the parade. He's not doing well, there was one of the parades. Yeah, that's one of the parades. I saw him sitting in the car, and one I saw him sitting with um, uh, uh, one of his relatives, Beverly Kramer. You know, and she was sort of taking care of him there. She was in my high school class. Yeah, I, uh, it just, it's, it, it, I still think it's a good place for families to bring up children when you compare it to most other places. Um, the drunk situation at the high school aside, that's been a great place to live. I agree. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. That's probably a good note to end on, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you very much for coming.